we all know the importance of a glycemic control in type 2 diabetics. In fact, in 1998, a famous landmark study called UKPDS was published. And what they did in the study, they enrolled 4,000 type 2 diabetics in the UK, and they compared intense treatment, either using metformin or SU or insulin, compared to conventional, where patients were given only diet without any medications. And they showed over 10 years' time that if you treat patients intensively with a drug, getting the A1C to 7% or less, you can reduce the rates of microvascular complications by 25% in general. And that included nephropathy, retinopathy, and neuropathy. Now, when the study ended at 10 years, they kept following patients over time to see what happens. And when they followed patients for another 10 years, what they saw was very interesting, that 20 years later from the beginning, not only they reduced the rates of microvascular complications, but also the rates of macrovascular complications, meaning heart disease and stroke. So it may take a long time to see the effect on CV events, but we can see the effect on microvascular complications really quickly. And based on that study and other smaller studies done, and also the CCT in type 1 diabetics, the ADA set the A1C goal at 7% or less in most patients. Based on guidelines, mostly ADA guidelines, they tell you that A1C goal for most patients should be 7% or less. And that's based on UKPDS and DCCT trials. Now, there are exceptions. Exceptions are if you see older patients defined as age above 60 with underlying CV events. So in those patients, the A1C goal shifts up to around mid-7%. Of course, if you see also patients, let's say, in their 80s, you might say, why be too strict? Let's have a goal up to 8%. So you can vary that A1C goal based on the age of the patients and the comorbid conditions they might have, mostly heart disease. Now, if you have younger patients without any CV events, and if you pick the agents which don't cause hypoglycemia, you can lower that A1C to less than 6.5% based on ACE guidelines. So that's why it depends on every patient. You set a different goal. Over 90% of people with type 2 diabetes are insulin resistant, but 100% of them have defects in beta cell function. And unfortunately, this is progressive over time. So it's really a matter of when you're going to require insulin, not if. As your endogenous insulin supplies dwindle, eventually you're going to need exogenous insulin to maintain adequate glycemic control. When patients are on insulin and we keep increasing the dose and that A1C doesn't come down and sugars remain high, patients become extremely frustrated because every time they call or they come in, we increase the dose, they don't see the outcome expected and they keep gaining weight because the more insulin you give, the more weight gain you might see in these patients. So what I see most of the time is frustration from patients. And that's why it's important when we reach a certain limit where patients are on high dose insulin and not responding, we should think, what can we do to help our patients? What are the options available? And also think about compliance issues because when we place patients on four injections a day of high dose insulin, obviously compliance could become a big factor why the A1C is not coming down. So that's when we should think about other options in these patients. Now A1C is extremely important as I said before, but we should not forget the importance of other factors also. Many patients, at least 60 to 80 percent, will have also metabolic syndrome where there's weight issues, hypertension, lipid abnormalities. So we should not forget about educating patients about the importance of diet, weight loss and exercise, about the treating hypertension, make sure that the blood pressure is at goal, treating lipids by adding a statin, and of course, smoking cessation because that's a big risk factor uh, for heart disease also.